Hi everyone, uh, welcome to tonight's event uh, at One Night Books. I'm Evan, the manager here at the store. Uh, I'm really so thrilled to be welcoming you all tonight to um, celebrate the spring collection of Fresh Bowl from the Universal. I'm out at this cheap books. Uh, it's an incredible collection, and we're really blessed to have him on yourself here, along with Robert Creswell, the translator of the uh, collection, and Ron Ricardo Phillips. Uh, Ron Ricardo is the author of Living Open for Poetry and also Circuit. Uh, Poet and translator himself, so the perfect moderator for this event. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to him. Thanks so much, everyone. Much appreciated. Good evening, everyone. Um, like a uh, like a referee in sport, I'm going to try my best to be here but not be seen um, and keep things going. So I just want to um, thank you for being here. And uh, I'm going to take a few moments to introduce both our poet and our translator, um, ask a question to set us on our way, see how that goes, um, pop back in with a few more questions. There will be poems sprinkled in all of these conversations, and we'll leave a bit of time for a Q&A um, at the back end, just a gentle reminder with Q&As, questions, like statements. Um, so I am very honored to be here and introduce um, this wonderful poet, Iman Roussel, uh, author of four books of poetry. Um, I will read them in their English translation titles. Uh, a Dark Alley Suitable for Dance Lessons, 1995. Walking as Long as Possible. Alternate Geography, those are from 1997 and 2006. And Until I Gave Up the Idea of Home. Uh, she also received the uh, Shizayed Book Award for Literature in 2021. And is a professor at the University of Alberta, Canada known as one of the leading poets in uh, Egypt. This wonderful translation, The Threshold, marks the first book in English. Second. Second book in English, thank you. Uh, it's translated uh, by the wonderful Robin Cresswell, who is a professor of comparative literature at Yale, uh, frequent contributor for the New York uh, Review Books, uh, the author of, I always forget after the subtitle, after the uh, colon, so let me get this right, City of Beginnings, Poetic Modernism in Beirut. It's a truly really wonderful book. Um, and also uh, is the former uh, poetry editor at the Paris Review, where in my estimation, it was uh, one of the finest runs of a poetry editor in the history of that magazine. <laughs> so and I, I actually, you don't know me, but I always mean what I say, and I certainly, I certainly mean that. Um, I know that I know that uh, poet and translator know each other very well and collaborated in a way that is um, um, really amazing to uh, create this amazing uh, publication. We'll be talking about that, and uh, with that, I think uh, it's for you to hear a lot less from me and a lot more from them. So I'm going to start off with a question that hopefully just blows a little bit of wind into your sails and leads you forward. Um, can the two of you share with us just the origin story of this book? What is the origin story of how this book came <laughs> together? Shall I talk? Of course, because yeah, it started yeah. for long. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so. I don't know that I need the micro microphone actually, mm -hmm. right? No, you're in fine you're, yeah. you're in fine voice. <laughs> um, so I went to NYU as a graduate student, and I was writing um, that book that Rowan uh, mentioned. And hi, come in. Um, and I was studying modern Arabic poetry. Um, I was writing the book is about kind of the Cold War and politics and um, a, a, a great famous poet, um, Syrio-Lebanese poet named Edonis. And I was reading him and thinking about Middle Eastern history. And um, Edonis, as well as contemporaries of his, like Nizar Abani, Mahmoud um, Darwish, these are three poets who've been pretty well translated. Uh, uh, this is not usual, but they've been pretty well translated into English. Um, these are very famous poets in the Arab world. They are famous public intellectuals. They write on um, public events. Um, and studying poetry turned out to be this great way for me, at least, to, to think about 
the history of the Arab world. Um, they're kind of public intellectuals, these poets, is how I came to think of them. And the poetry that they write is um, is fantastic. It's it's full of very high rhetoric. It's directed at events that, like the 1948 war, the 1967 war, um, the Intifada. Uh, it's often very, very political, but in a very, very sophisticated way. You call them civil you know. poets then, right? Yeah, they're kind of like civil poets. Um, one of the things that you don't find a, a huge amount of is kind of um, intimacy, individual voice. Their poems, are, they're, they're kind of pitched to large audiences. They're kind of poet prophets in a way. And <laughs> anyway, this is what I was writing about as a graduate student and a friend of mine who turned out to be a mutual friend uh, with Iman, a guy named Wael, who was an Egyptian, said, you know, well, these are great poets, but, you know, they're, they're kind of the poets that we read and study at school. And why don't you read something that you might enjoy in a very different way? And he gave me a book of Iman's poems. This was, this was almost 20 years ago. This is a long time ago. And, um, and yes. come in. There's, Please, there's chairs here? over, there's, the there's chairs over here. here. No, no, no. Please come in. Uh, I'm telling the story, the, the origin story of this book. So that book is maybe walking as long as possible? I think it was the yes. first book. I think it was Mamad um, Mu'adham. And this book, I, I read it, uh, and it kind of, it, it blew my mind. Uh, it was unlike any of the Arab poetry that I had been reading previously. And I, I can tell you, something about why, but I think at this point, actually it would be helpful to read a couple of poems. Is that all right? Yeah, why Good. <laughs> um, let's, let's start with you and Ismun. We'll hear these first in the original Arabic and then in Robin's translation. Li Ismun Musukri. I think, yeah. <clears throat> Is it working? Uh, yeah, it might help. Okay. ربما الشباك الذي كنت أجلس بجانبه كان يعيدني بمد غير عادي. كتبت على كراساتي إيمان طالبة بمدرسة إيمان مرسال الابتدائية ولم تستطع عسى المدرس الطويل ولا الضحكات التي تنط من الدكات الخلفية أن تنسيني الأمر فكرت أن أسمي شارعنا باسمي شرط توسيع بيوته وإقامة غرف سرية بما يسمح لأصدقائي بالتدخين داخل أسرتهم دون أن يراهم إخوتهم الكبار بعد هدم السقوف لتخفيف العبء عن الجدران ونقل أحزية الجدات الميتات والأواني والعلب الفارغة التي أخرجتها الأمهات خارج الحياة بعد خدمة طويلة إلى شارع آخر يمكن أيضا دهن الأبو الأورنج كتعبير نمزي عن البهجة وضع مقابض مخرومة تسهل على أي واحد التلصص على العائلات كبيرة العدد وبهذا لا يكون هناك شخص وحيد في شارعنا التجارب الرائدة تصنعها العقول الكبيرة هكذا كان يمكن أن يصفني عابرهن وهم يتنزهون على الرصيف الأبيض لشارع يحمل اسمي ولكن لكراهية قديمة بيني وبينه تركت أحجاره علاماتها في ركبتي ورأيت أنه غير جدير بذلك لا أذكر متى اكتشفت أن لي اسما موسيقيا يليق التوقيع به على قصائد موزونة ورفعه في وجه أصدقاء لهم أسماء عمومية ولا يفهمون المعنى العميق لأن تمنحك الصدفة اسما ملتبسا يثير الشبهات حولك ويقترح عليك أن تكون شخصا آخر كأن يسألك معارفك الجدد هل أنت مساحي أو هل لك أصول لبنانية للأسف شيء ما حدث فعندما يناديني أحد يعرفني أرتبك وأتلفت حولي هل يمكن أن يكون لجسد كجسدي ولصدر تزداد خشونته في التنفس يوما بعد يوم اسم كهذا ثم إنني أرى نفسي كثيرا بين غرفة النوم والحمام حيث ليس لدي معدة حوت لإفراغ ما أعجز عن هضمه 
I have a musical name. Maybe it was the window I sat next to that promised some unusual glory. In my notebooks, I wrote Iman, student at the Iman Marcel Elementary School. And neither the teacher's long stick nor laughter from the back rows could persuade me otherwise. I considered lending my name to our street, so long as its houses were enlarged and secret rooms built for my and worrying about older brothers. After the roofs are smashed to ease the pressure on the walls, the dead grandmother's slippers, pots, and empty jars, which after long service the mothers packed away, would be shipped off. Doors would be painted orange as a symbolic expression of joy, and peepholes would replace doorknobs so that anyone could look in on the boisterous families, and no one on our street would be lonely. Bold experiments are the product of great minds, is how passersby might speak of me as they stroll the sparkly sidewalks of the street that bears my name. But because of an old grudge between us, its stones had left marks on my knees. I decided the street didn't deserve the honor. I don't remember when I discovered that I had a musical name, a name suitable for signing at the bottom of lyrical poems and for waving in the faces of friends with ordinary names who couldn't grasp the true meaning of bearing such an ambiguous one, sowing unease all around and inviting you to become someone else when new acquaintances ask, are you Christian or are you part Lebanese? But something must have gone wrong because now when someone calls to me, I get confused and look all around. Is it possible that a body like my body and lungs like these growing raspier by the day could have a name like that? I often see myself moving between bedroom and bathroom without the benefit of a whale's stomach to get rid of what I can't digest. So that's, that's an example of kind of like the poem that you were finding when you turned away from Avenues, when you were turning away from this big type of scene. Yeah, and I, I think, um, as I was saying, one of the things that shocked me, really, uh, surprised me, was just this tone of um, intimacy. There was an individual talking, and the tone of voice takes lots of surprising turns. Like in this, this is just an example in this poem, you know, which begins in this comic braggadocio remembering uh, of childhood, um, you know, putting your own name on your school composition books and thinking about even naming uh, your own street after yourself. And, um, and what a great, beautiful, musical, um, ambiguous, mysterious name it is. And then suddenly there's a turn right at the end with that, but something must have gone wrong. Um, and then the last part of the poem um, turns to something much more um, inward, anxious, ambiguous. And I really just hadn't ever read a poem like that in Arabic that was so uh, individualized, so personal, so intimate, so surprising in the turns that it took. Um, and so I made a note, a mental note, um, and then years later, in fact, uh, when I became poetry editor at the Paris Review, and as Rowan knows, one of the very nice things about being poetry editor magazine is you get to ask your friends, or at least people, poets you admire, uh, to send you work so that you can publish it. So I wrote Iman, uh, whom I hadn't ever met um, or corresponded with, and asked her to send some poems, which she did. Um, and this was in 2010, uh, the winter of 2010 going into the um, spring of 2011, which was when the Arab Spring was taking place. Um, the springtime of the Arab Spring. Um, the, short, the short springtime of the Arab Spring. And, um, and one of the poems that Iman sent was a poem called um, Celebration. Yaktifan. Um, and I thought, this is a poem about the Arab Spring in a kind of um, uh, indirect way. And this uh, both interested me because I thought, well, it'd be nice to have a topical poem um, by an Egyptian poet. Which is kind of like not what you well, thought you'd get, right? You thought you'd get I didn't think I'd get it. And Iman's uh, reputation, if I can put it this way, is not to write directly <laughs> political 
poems. And so I thought, oh, well, this is both interesting if you know something about Iman's poetry, because it's about, it's kind of about tahrir in this way. And also, it's nice for us as a quarterly magazine to publish something that has some topical interest. <clears throat> the door is locked. Should we let them in? <laughs> Um, so I thought we, we, maybe we could just read that poem because I was, turns out I was wrong in many different ways about this poem, but, um, but maybe we could read it and, okay. and then talk about it a little bit. I read it, but it was published in Arabic 2008, so it has nothing <laughs> to do with the Arab Spring. <laughs> this is the punchline. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Always, always here to disturb the peace. Yes. I almost, uh, yes, here it is. Yeah. Okay. Ihtifal. وقع خيط القصة في الأرض فنزلت على ركبتي أبحث عنه كان هنالك ذلك الاحتفال الوطني ولم أرى إلى الأحذية المستوردة والبيادات على مقعد في قطار قالت لي أفغانية لم ترى أفغانيا الاتصال ممكن تمنيت يومها لو سألتها هل هذه نبوءة بدأت تهتهتي بالفارسية كأنها خارجة من كتاب المبتدئين وهي كأنها تلتقطها من خزانة ملابس قتل صاحبها في حريق لنفرض أن الشعب وصل عن بقرة أبيه إلى الميدان أن الشعب ليس كلمة قبيحة كما أن لا أحد يعرف ما معنى بقرة أبيه إذا كيف حضرت كل هذه الكلاب البوليسية إلى هنا ومن غطى وجوهها بأقنعة ملونة الأهم من ذلك أين سقط الخيط الذي يفصل بين الأعلام والملابس الداخلية بين الأناشيد والنشيج بين الله والبنات التي تمشي على الأرض تدفع الضرائب الاحتفال كأنني لم أنطق هذه الكاميقي حيث رجع أهالي سبارتا منتصرين إلى سبارتا ولم يجف دم الفرس على التروس والرماح ربما لم يكن هناك قطار ولا نبوءة ولا أفغانية جلست أمامي لساعتين أن الله يضلل ذاكرة مخلوقاته من وقت لآخر ليتسلى ولكن المؤكد أنني من موقعي هنا بين الأحذية والبيادات لن أعرف من بالضبط انتصر على من so I went down on my hands and knees to hunt for it. This was at one of those patriotic celebrations, and all I saw were imported shoes and jackboots. Once, on a train, an Afghan woman who had never seen Afghanistan said to me, triumph is possible. Is that a prophecy? I wanted to ask. My Persian was straight from a beginner's textbook. And she looked while listening to me as though she were picking through a wardrobe whose owner died in a fire. Let's assume the people arrived all mass at the square. Let's assume the people isn't a big word and that we know the meaning of all mass. Then how did all these police dogs get here? Who fitted them with party colored masks? More important, where is the line between flags and lingerie, anthems and anathemas, God and his creations, the one put on earth to pay taxes. As it came from Greek lexicon in which triumphant Spartans march home with Persian blood still wet on their spears and shields. Perhaps there was no trade, no prophecy, no Afghan woman sitting across from me for two hours. At times, for his own amusement, God leads our memories astray. What I can say is that from down here, among the shoes and jackboots, I'll never know for certain who triumphed over whom. Thank you, Frank. Good evening. That's really beautiful. No, you're reading, not my. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> it wouldn't have existed if that poem hadn't been here. Um, so the poem is about, if I can give my 
Yeah, help us out. Help us out. My interpretation, <laughs> which turns out to be in some ways, many ways, a misinterpretation. But the poem is about uh, about um, feeling estranged from the language that you speak, I think, or thought you knew. And there are two scenes, kind of parallel scenes, that there's no obvious connection between them. There's a scene on a train with the poet sitting across from a woman trying to speak Persian to this Afghan woman and the, the woman not quite understanding her. And... They're talking about trying. Maybe they're talking about the war in Afghanistan. We don't know. Um, and then there's this other scene, which is on a square in an unnamed city. But they're talking about a shab in Arabic. So the people. Um, something political is going on. There are jackboots and um, imported shoes. And the poet is somewhere on the ground in this square, we gather. And to me, this clearly meant that we were on Tahrir. Um, in 2011, where the people were chanting Ashab Yurid Asqat Nizam, the people want the downfall of the regime. And, um, and I thought, well, I, you know, I don't quite know what's going on in this poem, what the relationship is between the scene on the train and the scene in the square, but um, it's very interesting. It's very curious, this juxtaposition. And, uh, and I thought, one of the things that seems to be going on is that this word, a shab, the people, which, you know, there's no more important political word, um, which had been, I think it's fair to say, co-opted, co exactly, by the regime for many, many years. Um, the Mubarak's regime used the language of human rights and um, uh, patriotism and uh, a shab. Um, and it presumed to speak on their behalf. But all of a sudden it had been reclaimed and it was, it was being used again in a very anti-regime kind of manner. Anyway, I thought all of this was very interesting. Turns out I was totally wrong about this <laughs> poem, which had been written in 2008. <laughs> uh, were, you, were you told this nicely? Very nicely. Very nice. Just, oh, you know, then you're not the only one. <laughs> who's made the same mistake. Lots of people think that it's about you. Um, I didn't know that. So what is it about? What, what, what is it about? Hmm? What do you feel about it now? Looking back, what prophecy? I think, I mean, art and poems, you know, have life in, in their own. So I, you, you can't control it. You are not going to guard it. <laughs> um, but uh, but the only, the funny thing about it for those who think is that must be about uh, uh, Arab Spring, it's confusing. It's as if it's anti uh, even revolutionary language, right? So so sometimes I have for political reason actually to clarify this. Uh, even so, I did not believe in the word shab during the Arab Spring except for maybe 22 days or so. Like, it, actually, I'm right. In a way, like, what, what, what does this word mean? Who creates it and owes it and circulate it and you know like it's not it's still owned by by the political power not by the people uh, so but anyway uh, so it's to the conclusion and it was translated also during other yeah like uprising like ukrainian uprising which is for me was was very funny <laughs> so someone translated it actually from english from robin translation uh, to uh, just to, for you know publication to tell people that it's we can relate to this or whatever. So it's interesting journey. <laughs> so the origin story is a story of misinterpretation. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> well, but also finding I think what you what you didn't think you'd find. You said you were looking for you were looking to turn away from this um, big masculine prophecy civic poetry and then you found a poem that was literal prophecy right <laughs> and civic poetry but with a different texture. can i ask a new question my arabic is is is, is uh very bad non existent um is is shot both people and the people yes okay well can you talk a little bit about the decision to title the poem a celebration it's a celebration because the word pops up twice, right? The, the no, word... ihtifal, it's in Arabic. Ihtifal, uh, it's indefinite there's, in Arabic. There's no, yeah, it's indefinite. Yeah, there's it's no not article. al ihtifal it's in right? Arabic. Yeah, it's very clear. Yeah, I wouldn't allow this to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, <is> it... Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
misinterpreted. That. Perfect. Wonderful. <laughs> I have a lot of misinterpretations, but that wouldn't have been one of them. I, I got That's that. right. <laughs> okay. So, so where are we now in the origin story of of this book? We 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 have you um, uh, studying and being full on a certain type of poetics and being introduced to Iman's poetry, um, having your head turned, publishing it. Um, being wrong about it, you teach at Yale, so you don't have to call it misunderstanding. I call it misreading, right? <laughs> Blue it's, a creative, misreading. it's a creative misinterpretation. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, but how do we get from there to here? What happened? It took a really long time, actually. Can you and give us a condensed Iman, version? Of Iman, well, Iman has been very patient with me. Um, but we we published a lot of the translations in the Paris Review over the years, and then they accumulated to the point where um Iman said are, are we going to do a book or what and of course that was music to my ears and um so and then and then we decided to but then and then we worked very closely on it i mean um i would send her uh versions of poems and we talked over skype it's kind of pre-zoom <laughs> pre-zoom days yes uh, and Iman lives in Edmonton. So we'd have long conversations about my misinterpretations and um, she'd politely correct them. And we'd get closer and closer to, you know, versions of the poems that we were both happy with. But uh, it took a long time. Well, I, I in, in, in this wonderful poem, I have a, a musical name, the first poem um, that you read, um, you mentioned Raspy Voice, mm -hmm. which is something that in uh, the introduction, to this volume, Robin also at the end uh, notes. I, I, I just want to read briefly. Uh, Robin, you wrote um, in an early. I just want to read briefly. Uh, Robin, you wrote um, in an early poem. Uh, she as Iman uh, Iman Marcel Marcel in Arabic. It has connotations of flowering ease and looseness. Could possibly be attached to a person with raspy lungs. We heard that. That singular and strangely mellifluous rasp has been the tuning fork for my English translations. I'm so fascinated by that, and I was wondering if there are any moments in the in the in the work that you could point to, where that even in the in the in the work that you could point to, where that even you could point to, where the particularity of knowing uh, Iman's voice, or obviously the particularity of you knowing your voice, you were the one who first talked about your raspy voice in the poem, <laughs> led to decisions in translating the work that maybe would have um, gone in another direction if you weren't so familiar with this singular mm -hmm. raspy voice. And come to mind. Well, I mean, yes. Uh, maybe we can read another poem because I was really thinking about a particular poem. Well, poems I, are always the best explanation yeah. for questions <laughs> about poetry. <laughs> When I when I wrote that, but I, I would just say before you read the poem that it was really a that was the thing that I most wanted to get across in the translation was was a tone of voice, I mean Iman's tone of voice um, as interpreted as heard by me um, because I think that that is the um, really characteristic. Uh, of important characteristic of the poems is the is the singular individual intonation of them and um, uh, in fact her, her her voices it was it was nice because she could smoke in Edmonton and I could be in <laughs> New Haven or New York or wherever it was and we could work very closely um, Zoom or Skype has has that uh, silver lining I guess. <laughs> I also um, love this because it's such a wonderful contemporary collaboration, and I find myself personally loving my subjects that I'm translating to be dead, so I don't have to hear from them. But I love these wonderful, this wonderful example of really fruitful collaboration because um, for those of you who haven't translated, it's not always the case when you're dealing with Rob. Um, no, it's, um, it's not. And I've been, um, as Iman knows, uh, I've said this many times before, but I've been very lucky because um, uh, uh, Iman has been has, has been very helpful in identifying the places where things go wrong in the English without telling me how to make them. Um, and that's really all a translator can ask for is to be told when something is not is off. Um, and you know, then go fix it and come back and we'll talk about <laughs> it again. <laughs> um, but to the point about the mellifluous rasp, because I think it's a it's a great 
question, and I, I re and I did have a poem in mind when I was um, writing that, um, and maybe we can read Amina. Can we go? Uh, we are stuck in the early poems. We'll go. We'll go. <laughs> okay. We'll go. We'll go. <laughs> okay. I love this poem. I, I get bored so quickly. <laughs> I read Amina for for sure. <laughs> Amina. Let me uh, imitate the poets who tell stories about their poems. I hate to do this, but I, yeah, I want to do it <laughs> now. So this poem, uh, I went to Iraq 1992, and I was uh, it was like a gathering of lots of women from all over the world to support Iraqi women against American siege. And uh, uh, I was the youngest among them to the point that people thought I'm the daughter of Amina Rashid, who was a, an aristocrat, a French francophone, French professor at uh, Cairo University. And she was one of my uh, minotaurs, really, uh, in my early years in Cairo. So we stayed together in the same room in, a, in a Rashid Hotel. And the whole trip had great impact on me, I think, on my career and on my decision uh, to give up so many things to be a writer, giving so many things, including uh, politics and activism and feminism, whatever is there, <laughs> just to be a writer. So this poem really uh, meant, meant a lot to me because it was the first poem in the entire book, in uh, Dark Alley. So, um, Amina. <laughs> تطلبين البيرة بالتليفون في ثقة امرأة تعرف ثلاث لغات وتورط الكلمات في سياقات مفاجئة من أين لك كل هذا الأمان كأنك لم تتركي بيت أبيك أبدا ولماذا لحضورك هذا التخريب الخالي من القصد هذه الوطأة التي تخرج حواسي من عتمتها وماذا علي عندما تمنحني غرفة الفندق صديقة كاملة تماما سوى أن أكور في وجهها سوقية تليق بي أنا عادلة وأترك لك أكثر من نصف هواء الغرفة مقابل أن تريني بدون أشباه أنت التي تكبرين أمي بعشرين عاما تلبسين ألوانا مبهجة ولن تشيبي أبدا صديقة الكاملة تماما لماذا؟ قد أبشر بدخول الصناديق الرمادية وأنا أجرب أشياءك الأنيقة فعلا لماذا لا تخرجين تاركة كل هذا الأكسجين لي قد يدفعني الفراغ الذي خلفك لأن أعد شفتي ندما وأنا أرى فرشاة أسنانك أليفة وللا أمينة You order beers on the telephone with the confidence of a woman who speaks three languages and ties her words in colorful knots where did you get this calm assurance, as if you'd never left your father's house? How do you always intimidate without intending to? What is this magnetism that draws me out of myself? And what is it with me that when a hotel room offers me the perfect friend, I hurl in her face my usual vulgarities, the coarseness I'm so fluent in? Go ahead, be shocked. I'm a fair-minded person. I'll give you more than half the air in the room so long as you see me for what I am, Gray. My perfect friend, why don't you get out now? Then I could climb into your silver-colored suitcases and try on your elegant outfits. Why don't you get out and leave all the oxygen to me? The empty space you leave behind might make me bite my lips in regret as I ponder your toothbrush wet and familiar well you know that poem actually touches on something that i've been dying well let me say about mellifluous and rasp here yeah, please, please, please. <laughs> and one of the things that i that i think i still think um is amazing about this poem is the the mixture of tones um that this is it's an address the poem addressed to Amina, and it's clearly admiration and love and respect, and um, but also antagonism and um, uh, a feeling of being um, not recognized. And you know, it's a young person's poem about somebody whom she 
loves but needs to be out of the way in some way so that she can be who she is. And the the, the tone just veers between, it's so surprising, you know, why don't you get out now? Um, but then, and that's, again, just kind of that, that Quicksilver turns of voice that I, you know, wanted to try to get into English. But a, a difference, um, a particular difference, in that last stanza, the, the empty space you leave behind might make me bite my lips in regret as I ponder your toothbrush. Familiar and wet is the way I translated it the first time. Though those are the words. Familiar and wet is kind of, it would be easy. And because it rhymed, regret and wet, and because I hadn't tried for the rhyme, I thought, you know, a rhyme that you don't look for is like a gift. I mean, you might as well take it. Um, and there's a kind of click when you get a rhyme that you're not actually even looking. That's the perfect rhyme. The perfect rhyme is the one that you're not even looking for. And so, uh, and there's a certain mellifluousness to any rhyme. Um, but he made poems don't rhyme. And for this part, and, uh, and I thought turning those two adjectives around would be more, um, accurate to the rasp, I guess. There's a line in this poem. Um, there's another poem. <laughs> I'll give you more than half the air in the room as long as you see me for what I am, which leads me to think about all of the claustrophobic spaces or spaces that I read as claustrophobic in your uh, poems, whether it's sharing a room with this unspoken antagonism, um, theater spaces, uh, urinals, uh, buses, airplanes, um, the interior of the body itself, uh, the prose poem, I think is actually another one. Um, and I was wondering if you can tell us about um, what this sense of um, uh, kind of complicated proximity means to you and your imagination. Are these songs of togetherness? Whitman on a ferry with everyone crossing to Brooklyn, right? Or are they songs of um, isolation? And of course, there's the uh, one poem that really stands out as the other, the wonderful, the threshold, this open air um, road poem, um, which seems an exception to the rule. But I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about, if you if thought about this at all, just how your, your poems occupy these really cramped uh, spaces. I don't think I thought about it in this way. I mean, it's good usually to hear to rethink. Actually, um, my, most of my poems are um, are dealing with geography more than history, and mm. um, either the body or or the relations of the uh, and the position of the individual in in this complicated net of relations around uh, here uh, or the cities, different cities, and so on. And I think it's it's the perfect way to be isolated and alienated is, is to, to go to this liminal space and, and try to position yourself in it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for me, for example, um, in, my, in my mind, without writing any poems, I think from an early age, I, I associate bathrooms with crime. <laughs> for no reason, and and public space with, for with, with urinating seriously, I do. You would, so make this is, great, you would make a great New Yorker. So this is <laughs> my <laughs> this is my way of thinking about the world before be, writing it down. It just it might come in a poem, but but this is the way I think about you know public space is you, is usually this um, this scary place, this ugly space controlled by power and and by men and uh, and uh, uh, you are and an, um, you are uh, more more really um, fragile in it because you can be exposed to whatever yeah. um while while bathrooms have this you know high 
you know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, high um, value because you can cry and then no one can bother you in a bathroom. <laughs> Unless you have a child who is for you, is is big part of even uh, even after living uh, elsewhere. Um, so, Cairo is a city that that actually uh, can create the lens in which you can see other cities. Mm. So, um, so for example, I love New York because you might walk in a dirty street, but Edmonton you can't. I mean, Edmonton is very clean, right? Don't you hate that? Uh, here is crowded. Edmonton, uh, you feel like you know the streets are empty. People are driving. So, so Cairo is my city, and 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 I feel it. It comes to me a lot in in other uh, places. Like it's not that I compare at all, but it, it just it's my way of um, relating to other places by by seeing them from the lens of Cairo. Yeah. I also think about, I, I truly never noticed that. Uh, it's kind of, kind of embarrassing that, to admit that I never noticed that about about the, the cramped the cramped or interior spaces in the poems. Um, I, I want I, I think it also has to do with maybe again uh, you know in, in in small spaces a certain kind of voice is appropriate uh, that intimacy that I think is part of what makes Iman's poetry distinctive. Yeah, um, great me some song. Yeah, yeah, and whereas that the, the the poem that this the, the the title poem of the book is this poem on the road. It's a poem about kind of making one's way through uh, the open spaces of Cairo, and it has this. It's not exactly Whitmanian, I don't think, but uh, it has this feeling of being, you know, of walking, of of um, loitering through the streets, not knowing, not going any particular direction and finding oneself at the, at, the, at the end of the poem, having gone from the fancy opera house in, um, in the fanciest part of the city uh, through the downtown areas and then finding yourself in the city of the dead, yeah. The city of the dead in, a, in an enormous <clears throat> cemetery, open air cemetery. Um, because, yeah, departing Egypt and, uh, and also uh, being 30, as a mark in the world, um, both are actually connected in my mind with the city, with mm. with with this geography. Yeah. Uh, and I think geography is really a good, important way is to capture history. Yeah. So. Um, Absolutely. Well, certainly in this country, I, I often tell my students, if you really want to learn about the United States, the first thing you have to do is look at the map, mm -hmm. stare at the map for a while. Should we should we read a map store since we've been talking about a map it? store? Yeah. Okay, and it's a late poem, so <laughs> not right. a middle poem. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. I feel like I'm a very old poet. I have early work and middle work, and I mean it's still early for that. But anyway, I get it. The great thing about store. poets is you're, you're a young poet until you're about sixty-five, right? All right. <laughs> That's my I'm story. I'm so I'm happy to hear you. this. <laughs> <laughs> map store. It's in, uh, yes. Another poem that kind of like glances at a political event without. Yeah, I mean, it's naming it. Yeah. yeah. It's anyway about your city. <laughs> so. بإمكانك تخيله عائدا من الحرب. تلك الحروب التي تنمو في مكان آخر. صناعة فيلم شبه واقعي. المهم أنه في شمال إفريقيا وبخبرة في العطش افتتح دكانا بيع العصائر كان يضع الثلج فوق المشروبات الصحية التي أصبحت في أواخر الأربعينيات أمارة على أمريكا في عهدها الجديد العادل حين اكتشف مياها تنز من الصناديق الأربعينيات أمارة على أمريكا في عهدها الجديد العادل حين اكتشف مياها تنز من الصناديق فتهيأ له بحر يابسة ثم جزيرة من هنا تولدت لديه فكرة مشوشة عن الجغرافيا ثم جاء حفيده الذي لم يذهب أبدا إلى الحرب فحول الدكان إلى مكان لبيع الخرائط لو مررت من هنا يوما 
في هذا الشارع الذي يشبه شريانا مسدودا في قلب منهاتن سترى أناسا ليسوا من هنا يدخلون ويخرجون ونادرا ما يشترون شيئا أنا مرة رأيت امرأة تمسح التراب عن جبل وبنتا ترسل خصلة من شعرها في بحيرة وسمعت آخر يحاول أن يصف, أن يصف, أن يصف لآخر لآخر معه موقع بيته البعيد في قريته البعيدة بالقرب من مدينة بعيدة تظهر مثل نقطة في خريطة بلده البعيد أنا أمر من هنا لا لأشارك هؤلاء الغرباء حسرتهم ولا لأضع الماء في النيل الذي يبدو مثل ثعبان نائم في الرسم المعلق في مواجهة الباب ولا حتى لأتأمل ذلك البهاء الذي لابد كان هناك في أعلى الركبة لصاحب الدكان الأصلي الذي أرى الآن صورته في زي الجندي ونيشانه دون أي ذكر لرجله الخشبية أو للماء الذي نز من الصناديق أنا لا أعرف ماذا أو من هنا حقيقة <تصفيق> لأن الآن أشهد بعني بائع الخائط مرعوبا ربما للمرة الأولى في حرب لم يجد وقتا ليذهب إليها الحرب هذه المرة جاءت إليه Map store Imagine him coming back from a war One of those wars that happen elsewhere From which some people return with memories enough To make a film that feels almost realistic Coming back, as I say, from a desert in North Africa, an opening with his newfound expertise and thirst, a juice stand. He was dropping some ice into those freshly squeezed beverages, which became at the end of the 40s an emblem of the new Pax Americana, when he discovered water puddling under the cooler. He imagined a sea, a mainland, an island, and in this way there grew within him the vague idea of what geography is. Later, a grandson who had never been to war converted the juice stand into a map store. If you pass by someday on a blocked artery in the heart of Manhattan, you'll see people who aren't from here coming and going and rarely buying anything. I once saw a woman brush some dust off a mountain and a girl trail one of her braids over a lake. And I heard one man try to describe to another the location of his distant house in a distant village, close to a distant city, which appeared as a tiny dot on the map of his distant country. I pass by this place not to share these strangers' griefs, nor to pour water into the Nile, which appears as a motionless snake on the map that hangs facing the door, nor even to contemplate the aura that must have been there just above the right knee, wearing his uniform medals, but with no sign of the wooden leg and no trace of the water that leaked from his cooler. To tell the truth, I don't know why I keep coming here, but I can see now, with my own eyes, the map seller, terrified, perhaps for the first time, living through a war he couldn't sign up for, because this time the war came to him. You want to tell a story about this poem? I mean, it's about New York, obviously, and it's about it's after. September 11, and it's after America took my green card back. <laughs> so I was here as a visitor in New York. And um, yeah, and the map store really, I mean, an actual map store somewhere was was the image that, um, that inspired this poem. Yeah. And what about the cooler leaking water that turns into the owner's image of what a sea is, or what an island is, or what a mainland is. Where did that come from? I don't know, but I actually, it strikes me sometimes when people don't know much about geography, you know, um, the, the idea of, and I, I mean, you can imagine, uh, you know, um, the, the idea of my best tour, you know, it's, it's, I think it's imagination more than anything really. But 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 it has this feeling that not knowing the geography, even if you went to a war in North Africa and you came back, it just 
two dots in the map. I mean, your place and another other people's place. Mm -hmm. So maybe this this feeling or image is is behind the poem. Mm -hmm. There's a strong feeling of um, high level of uh, Elizabeth Bishop in that poem. Mm -hmm. Is that poem that I think Elizabeth Bishop would have been? Do you have a, a smile just crossed <laughs> cross your face from? I thought of it. That's all. I think it, I, th I think it's just um, fantastic. We're gonna take questions, but before we do that, is there one poem that you really would not want to leave here without sharing with us that we haven't touched? This is a very interesting question. <laughs> not really, but we can we can ask the audience, do you want me to go. read a particular poem if anyone I, I love that you traffic in honesty. Great. So then why don't we why don't we um were you two ready to open it up to uh, yeah. okay. we, we're, we'd like to take questions? I saw a hand just flash up. I was commenting on something regarding the map store, I think, because um, I, I cannot think of it and not think of politics and how maps are banned in Egypt too. Mm -hmm. And what does, I mean, when I ask myself why Iman ended up in a map store, it's a rarity to mm -hmm. see maps mm -hmm. in our country. And it's definitely a place we have to step in. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I really felt a lot when, when the, with the image of the of the Nile sleeping uh, as a snake, uh, yeah. as, as a snake, exactly. Mm -hmm. In Arabic, even sounds much better. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this idea of seeing uh, you seeing a map. Seeing where you are located, it's also a political thing. People don't know about geography because of that, not not mm -hmm. only because of ignorance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it was more of a commentary, but maybe I don't know if, if you missed maps. I don't know if you went from the generation who saw maps or missed maps. And we used to draw them in. I mean, we used to, part of our high school exams was to draw map and depending on the geography you are studying you have to draw a map yeah. and i think i mean maps are are very handy now but with with less really uh, knowledge about them or or not knowledge maybe um looking at them it's like lots of uh, pictures are out there images on our phones but but we don't have the same feeling of energy about uh, images and pictures anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So the same thing with maps. I think they are there. I mean, you can use uh, you can use you know your phone to know where you are going, but and this means you are not looking around you um, to see the street to see um, <laughs> you know. This I think this is this is how I feel about it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, um, just to clarify before I ask the question, this um, this is a collection of works translated that were published in different books. Uh, yes. Yeah, everything you mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious, um, for, from both of you, like what was that process of sort of picking different poems? Uh -huh. and for you, um, Inan, as the poet, like what was that like to watch your poem sort of go into a different order becoming conversation with different works. Um, I, I'm very interested in that sort of mm -hmm. view of the um, translation. Mm -hmm. uh, so as, as Robin said, uh, at the beginning, it was, uh, he kept actually translate poems and publishing it, but the idea of book was not there. So as, as soon as the idea of uh, a selection come, uh, came uh, and we discussed it, um, he had you know, um, I think Robin is the one who selected the poems, actually, but I was very happy about his selection. I think only one poem that I uh, suggested, which is called The Clot, which is a poem mm -hmm. written 1994, and it's about my father. And actually, it's one of the last poems to be translated because my father died last year, and Somehow, I mean, it maybe it was an emotional thing more than anything. I wanted this poem to be included. So it, I, I feel it's a great, actually, if, if the translator 
the other eye, the one who is reading the poems uh, while translating it, is the is the one to choose, not the poet. Mm -hmm. I, I believe so. So I, I I felt like grateful that actually he he selected these poems in particular it was uh, fantastic for me. Yeah. Well, and that was <clears throat> nice of you to let me. Um, but and we talked about it a lot. I mean, we talked about what we talked about most was how to arrange them. This once, was a question. Yeah, yeah once we, once we, uh, it, because I was picking poems um, in part because of what I thought I could do successfully in English. Um, and of course the poems that I liked in particular. Um, and, and then, but then there was the question of, okay, well, what's the arrangement of these poems in a book? And we talked a lot. Well, it's because you have that. all those prose poems coming at the back, right? So there's this story of also a formal Yes. Structural, yeah. Well, well you call it transformation or evolution, or there's that too. I mean, there are more like like poems um, like that, and then there are prose poems, and there are more, more and more prose poems as mm -hmm. we get, I think, towards the back of the book. And you know something about what prose poems are in Arabic because they're not exactly the same thing as they are in English. But but when we were talking, we talked at length, and it was really fun actually. This part of um, making the book was the arrangement of them. What comes first? What comes later? And the poems are roughly chronological. Um, mm -hmm. Except we moved some poem, poems. Interesting to have a short poem and then long poem, not two long poems after each other, for example. Mm -hmm. We but, did, yeah, we did that kind of arrangement. But we also we also wanted it to feel like a kind of a kind of life story. I mean. Iman is a poem of an individual voice, but also poems about, um, you know, I, I think like a, a, a singular persona. And so to give some sense of like an arc, of a life arc, we wanted that to be the case too. So figuring out all of these, you know, the ways these puzzle pieces fit together, um, the chronology, the lengths of the poem, um, and, mm -hmm. and how to, you know, I think like reflect a person uh, or to convey a person, those were the those are the things that were uptermost in our minds when we were selecting selecting the poems. After, or after I had selected the poems, when we were arranging them. Mm -hmm. Will you tell us a little bit about the prose poem? Will you tell us a little bit about the prose poems? Kind of what uh, what they are. <laughs> Those are the only so I mean, we call it, we call it prose poem or cassette nest because we didn't we didn't know better, you know. So um, in full words by the French, you know, um, fr by French poetry, by translating Suzanne Bernard uh, prose poem mm. uh, uh, book and, and so mm. on. And, um, uh, but I, I really think for me personally, and maybe for my generation too, the form was not the issue uh, at all. I think discovering our, in everyone in, in his own uh, to discover your own voice was the issue especially if you are a young arab poet uh, in the 90s mm. um like you have great um modern arabic poetry poetry that also uh, started to be uh, written in the form of free verse since mm. the late 30s or so and um, diverse uh, and maybe controlled by prophecy and uh, grand narrative and and all of that, but but you have great poets. Uh, so um, asking the question about individuality, asking the question about what all of these discourses, Arab nationalism, wars, um, social classes, blah blah blah. Why 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 poetry is involved in this way? Mm -hmm. It's not like these issues are not important. Um, so, so, um, so I think through this process, we became more interested in uh, what we call prose poem. But to give you an example that the, the uh, term is not uh, agreed upon, the great Iraqi poet Sarkon Bolis, uh, who actually was living in San Francisco since 1969 mm -hmm. until 2005 or so. Translated a lot of beat. Poets. Absolutely, and he he had impact on us, uh, his poetic, because uh, Robin talked about Adunis and Mahmoud Rush and so on. As a young poet, really, I was 
I, I studied Adonis. I wrote my master about Adonis, about the Sufi intertextuality in the poetry of Adonis, for example. However, Adonis for me was not the poet that you will go and read in the end of the night in your room <laughs> at all. Uh, but you would read Circumbolus instead. Circumbolus was uh, the poet who who gave us this sense you that... in the bathroom? <laughs> no, not sometimes, but not, not circumbolus. <laughs> so, like circumbolus, maybe for me personally, is a poet who gave me this um, belief that I can express myself in Arabic. It's yeah. not impossible. Yeah. So I don't have to be, you know, uh, to 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 be, you know, interested in this grand narrative to be a poet. Mm -hmm. I can talk about um, everyday things or or a. Uh, a marginalized moment in my life and I can avoid sentimentality if I want and uh, and so on yeah. so Sir Kun Bolas, to make it short in his um, he has a wonderful interview in Parnassus uh, and uh, he he said that what we are writing is not prose poem it's actually free verse and in his yeah. opinion the free verse in Arabic poetry since the late 30s until the, the 80s, 90s, and, and so on, were um, very interested in music still. And in one uh, a strong voice dominating the poem. And the poem doesn't have so many layers that are contradicting each other. And this is why the, the, the term prose poem became, you know, um, more handy to describe particular uh, uh, poems written from the 90s. Can I just say on the expressing yourself in Arabic? Could you elaborate a little bit on your relationship to the first part? Because you don't exactly write in dialect, and the first part you don't seem to be very, um, you know, it's the polite word, like you're not very keen on Arab, or mm -hmm. uh, you're not stickler with it, let's say. Right. Um, tell us more. Tell us more. I mean, I think what I'm, I'm writing here is Fosha, but modern Fosha, modern Fosha, which means the Fosha understood by people today. Um, and because also most of the poems. Maybe are, we should just say those who mm -hmm. don't speak, don't know in Arabic, Ronik. Oh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Arabic is a diglossic. It's sometimes called a diglossic language, so there is a, a vernacular. I don't know this word, by the way, so yeah. it's good that he talked. Okay, um, continue. <laughs> where, there's a, where there's a there's a vernacular language, which is the language that's spoken. It's a different vernacular in Cairo than it is in Damascus, than it is in Baghdad, than it is in Morocco. Um, and it, for the most part, it's not it's not a written language. There are examples of written vernaculars. But, and then there's the written language, which is Fasha. Uh, which is what Iman writes her poetry in. Yes, but I feel this Fosha that is my medium has so many levels. And sometimes a whole poem would be inspired by this, by, by the crash between two levels or mm. so. I mean, like, like, for example, like for me, uh, like uh, one of the, uh, the, some of the cults, for example, uh, in my early poems in particular, when Robin was translating it, was really uh, the playful language between the language of Adonis and Mahmoud Darwish and the language of Quran and my own language. So I was I was inspired in some points by by even uh, these layers in the language we are speaking uh, in the nineties, for example. So um, so when you listen to uh, a poem from Adonis. Uh, you, you will you will see. I mean, it's it's wonderful language, of course. But but I think um, the interest in metaphor and the interest in the language itself, in in in, in a, a particular way, is more a way more than we distinguish ourselves by not being interested in the language this way. We are interested in the language to carry the meaning, like to to, to um, as opposed to. As opposed to the language as a target in itself. Yeah. Like, for example, if you see some of Mahmoud Daru, 